All right, thank you so much for joining us on our 139th edition of Lunch Out Loud Ottawa. My name is Nick Bachuski, and of course, we're the podcast that talks to the people, places, events, and music that make this city the incredible city that it is. And one thing that makes the this city an incredible thing is awesome authors writing awesome books about this city, and especially urban planning, which if you've listened to this show, you know I have a love for, and I'm very pleased to talk to Alain about his awesome book, Transforming Ottawa. But before we get to Alain, why don't we check this out? Hey, this is Marco from The Stringers. You've been listening to the Lunch Out Loud Ottawa podcast. If you like what you've heard, you can find all of our music we've released on our Bandcamp. So at thestringers.bandcamp.com. We have our own website, thestringersband.com. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Search us on YouTube. There'll be some music videos and such there. We have a show next Friday, December 18th with Amos the Transparent at Zafod's on York Street. Doors at 8 p.m. Tickets are 10 bucks. It's going to be a very good time. Thank you very much for listening. So that was the Stringers, Betty and Veronica. So catch them playing with Amos, the Transparent, at uh, the Christmas show coming up. And uh, awesome thing for today is we're actually uh, doing recording this episode at a breather. So this is my first time using breather. Thank you so much, Eric, for allowing us. I guess there's three locations in the city, and that was pretty easy, eh? Yeah, uh, getting in. Yeah. Yeah. So we're right off uh, Metcalf Street, 162 Metcalf Street. And uh, you just go to breather.com. It's 20 bucks for an hour. So if you're doing small meetings, so I know a lot of, uh, you could be a tech company out in Canada, have a meeting downtown, and very easily for $20, you have your own private meeting space. I guess this can fit four people in here. and That's uh, pretty interesting. Yep. So check it out, and then you get the app, and uh, very easy to extend if you need it longer and everything. It's awesome. All right. So I had the pleasure this past weekend of going through the 300 some odd pages of Transforming Ottawa, uh, Canada's capital in the eyes of Jack Graber. Thank you so much for that. That was a, it's a, one thing off the bat, it's, I, you really learn your directions after reading this book, after looking at all, because uh, there's a, it's such a vast array of uh, photographs from the 1930s all over kind of the, the the older part of Ottawa, and you have to read uh, looking west, looking north, looking south, so you're always trying to put yourself right in the location, so that was, a, that was a lot of fun, and I know my east and west and north and south very well now, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that uh, when you look at those pictures, it were they were taken by a photographer that was given the job to go out there from Public Works Canada and take pictures of the intersections around town. Yeah. And uh, so basically, I mean, it, it, they're unique shots because they're street views. They're not shots of buildings in, in particular, specific areas or, or, or monuments or anything. They're not postcards. They're not meant to be. The guy is standing at a corner and shooting down the street and then turning around and shooting west and shooting east, turning around and shooting south. And that's a unique set of, of uh, views. Absolutely. So, it's real life. And it's absolutely real life, and he catches details. I mean, they're they're very uh, high resolution, so you can zoom into them and uh, catch little details that uh, you know f- f- from a distance you don't notice them. But yeah. w- once you get up close, it's incredible. I mean, the uh, the richness of those pictures and what they say about the city is. How fantastic. long would you say you spent on every photograph, looking co- like looking at every photograph? I, I still spend time with them because I really? just like them. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, when when I was uh, putting this together, I, I uh, put about three hundred pictures in the book out of a collection of. 
I'd say almost a thousand. So okay. I really, I really picked the best ones. Wow. Um, but you can sort of zoom in, and in a lot of cases, I've provided a, uh, a portion of a picture because I thought that the uh, the detail said more than the overall. Oh, okay, okay. So okay. Uh, I did a little bit of work just cropping some and, and just uh, zooming in on some of the detail. Very interesting. Yeah. So before we'll, we'll talk about the, a lot of the book in just a moment, but first we like to get to know our guests. Uh, so what part of t- parts of town have you lived in since you went to t- uh, university in Montreal? Right. I did uh, Ottawa U for my undergrad. Okay. So and, uh, I mean, I'm a Sandy Hiller. I live there now with uh, my wife and two children. Uh, my dad lives across the street. My uh, in-laws are next door to us, so I'm, I'm rooted in Sandy Hill. I've wow. been there for like, oh, about 30 years. Uh, started down in Alta Vista. Uh, and when my parents first arrived in Ottawa, we were on Canterbury. So, um, you know, sort of... Uh, inside the green belt at all yeah. times and uh just uh, had apartments here and there chinatown whatever and just ended up in sandy hill again because i like it so much was it, were the uh, homes in alta vista the kind of like the 1950s uh they were made for uh m- veterans and military or just, um my my grandfather lived on pleasant park so that's how we i wasn't too far away from there i was on fairbanks but uh, I think by then they were just, you know, regular residential houses. We were past the initial wave of soldiers returning from Europe. And uh, there are nice bungalows out there. Yeah, bungalows. Yeah. And, and those costs of uh, those homes have exploded astronomically in the past 10 years. Very desirable. Well, they kind of. have. Yeah, because Alta Vista was the edge of town at the beginning when it was first settled. But now it isn't. No. And it's just, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to downtown. Yeah. Uh, there is rapid transit. There's uh, that proximity is is much much different now that we're a city of a million and a half in a greater area, and you're basically a, uh, hopping a skip away from downtown than being, you know, in one of the furthest locations. So that's the value of those houses right there. Plus, there's a hospital. I mean, there's a bunch of things that start to yeah. happen when the neighborhoods layer. Right? Yeah, and it's a very nice, uh, nice parks and nice schools out there as well. So uh, you. Oh, did you always go to the University of Montreal for your master's in urban planning with the thought of coming back to Ottawa? Well, um, I did like Montreal quite a bit. Okay. And um, back then, uh, it was almost impossible to get a job. I came back here uh, just because I knew the place better and uh, you know, I, I wanted to do something in Ottawa for sure. Uh, but I would have stayed in Montreal a little more if, uh, if I'd had the opportunity. It's a, it's a great city to learn things at, and uh, it's a very enjoyable city as well. I always say Montreal is the kind of place we want to be when we grow up or when we grow, grow yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. You know? it's, it's got a, um, a sense of itself, uh, a life, a street life, uh, architectural language, uh, a sense of urban design that I really admire, and uh, I think we can learn from them. Some very excellent sections. I, I've spent a lot of time in the... Uh on the hill, Mount Royal in the uh, Westmount area. Right. It's just beautiful architecture out there. And, and my wife is from uh, Montreal as well. So, I mean, I've, I've known that city quite well over the years, gotten to really appreciate it and uh, walked it, you know, uh, hours and hours and hours. Up the hill? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Up and sure. down the hill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and kind of what were your projects that you did in for master's in urban planning? Do you remember? Well, yeah, the University of Montreal is is a good planning school. It's one of the best in in Canada, in my view. They give you um, a lot of the traditional North American land use planning, but also the European uh, approach to urban design. And the blend of the two, I I find, is really interesting. Uh, They were connected with Barcelona quite a bit uh, at the time that I was there. And we got teachers that got us to do a lot of uh, studio work on um, blocks, just, you know, block repair and, uh, you know, urban surgery sort of thing in areas of Montreal that needed that kind of attention. So it was very hands-on. Uh, we had, you know... And the city worked with you with that? Uh, no. Uh, it was really the, the profs. Okay. Uh, and I have good memories of working in teams of four on, you know, blocks or parks or, uh, you know, how to stitch two pieces of city together and how to um, make sure that the edges and the content talk to each other. Uh, there's a lot of that theory that you get to apply in those those studios. So you know it was uh, it was enjoyable work. I mean, right away when I started, I knew that this was for me. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I always say that if I could start over again, I probably would have taken urban planning in university, maybe Waterloo, maybe uh, Montreal. So yeah. also so uh, this is your second book that you've written. Your first one was back in 2004. Right. Uh, it was about the uh, arts, kind of more arts and culture of the. 
this city? Uh, it was, well, the genesis was that the Elgin Cinema closed on me. And okay. that's where I had seen Raiders of the Lost Ark and seen a bunch of movies, and I couldn't believe that they were closing down the Elgin Cinema. Yeah. And, you know, I thought it was a big waste, for one, and unnecessary, because people went. Mm-hmm. And uh, it got me thinking about, um, well, if, um, if this one is shutting down, uh, how many others could there have been? And I started to do a bit of research, and I found that there were tons of them. Yeah. Neighborhoods had cinemas as, you know, a living room has a couch, basically. And uh, the pictures that started to come up when I went through archives were so incredible that I decided to write the story of Ottawa and Gatineau theaters and cinemas wow. and uh, so that was the theater near you and yeah it's, it's uh, 11 years ago now so I'm going to have to uh, I'll have to read that one next because I, I, I learned about in your book now you talk about all the cinemas on well there's a couple of them on Spark Street yeah. or it, there was about three or four in that downtown well, all together the city had about 70 70? Yeah. Wow. And we've completely forgotten about that now. Uh, a lot of them are, are completely gone and, and vanished from memory. Others uh, still have the building, but they've been converted to other uses. Of course, we know Barrymore's. Uh, we know, I mean, some are, are used as churches. Some are used as bowling alleys. Some are used as pharmacies. I mean, the buildings are still there if you look close enough. Yeah. Uh, some of them are just storefronts, and you can see the brackets where marquees used to hang. So, I mean, there's, there's uh, traces of that past if you look close enough and you know where to look. Interesting. Uh, which is really interesting, yeah. Have you been to Live on Elgin? Uh, actually, I saw that place when it was under construction, but I haven't yet uh, been able to catch some, a show there. So it's great shows yeah, there. It's uh, right next door to where the Elgin Theater yeah. used to be. Yeah, so, yeah. and, and uh, great acoustics there, so I really like that. So, uh, if you could add a chapter over the 11 years, what would that chapter be? Well, the, uh, the catching up of the cinemas that have closed since 2004. Of course, we lost Rio World Center, Exchange, World yeah. Exchange Plaza. You know, there's a, f- a few others that uh, have fallen by the wayside. And Capitol Music Hall, like if we're talking concert venues, I, I loved that when that first opened and became Claridge, mm-hmm. the condos. Yeah. And then yeah. moved to another place and closed down. Yeah. There's, uh, I just picked up a book myself uh, this past weekend, the uh, book by Ken Rockburn on Le Hibou. Uh, Café Le Hibou, yeah. and I think there's, there's a... There's a book about Le Hibou? Oh, there is, absolutely wow. there is, yeah. And it's a fascinating read. I'm just In Wakefield? Going through it. Eh? In Wakefield? No, on Sussex. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, there is a story to be written about Ottawa bars and night spots at some point in time, for sure. So that's... A, that, okay, we're hearing it first, that's your next book. <laughs> I don't know if it's my next book, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of people that are putting the pieces together. And uh, I, I'm an avid reader and follower of anybody who does that work. What are some of your other, uh, if somebody's listening, they want to read some other books about Ottawa, do you have any right off the top of your head that you would highly recommend that? There's, well, yeah, about? there's starting to be more and more of them. Um, there is one that I particularly like called Ottawa Streetcars. And it oh. uh, tells the story of the streetcar network uh, from the horse-drawn days to the uh, ultimate removal in 1959. Um, there's... Uh, a book coming up by Professor David Gordon called Town and Crown, and he goes into quite a bit of detail on the history of planning between the federal government and Ottawa. Um, and it's a little bit of what I pe- uh, pick up in my book here, Transforming Ottawa, but he t- takes a more academic uh, uh, view of, of the relationship between Town and Crown over the years, which is fascinating in itself. Yeah, and that's one of the questions I was going to ask you. Uh, well, 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 we'll get into that bit in a bit, but yeah, one of the questions was... When, because there's been a lot of uh, raising in Le Breton, and uh, I didn't even know about the neighborhood just west of Parliament that was taken down for the uh, the Supreme Court. Supreme Court, right? And like people had homes overlooking; like those would be really multi multi million dollar homes now, overlooking the Ottawa River there. For sure, yeah. Uh, how did government go about moving these people? Where do you know which areas of town the the owners of these homes of Victoria Street and where did these people go and how much money were they given by the government or how did that, was there any arguments or? Um, it was very different uh, than what happened later at Le Breton Flats. Uh, okay. There's actually uh, a series on apartment 613 uh, by Andrew Elliott that's tracing the history of those movements uh, Wonderful. in that awesome. neighborhood uh, that became the Supreme Court. Uh, And it's interesting to see that uh, those homes were all expropriated in 1912, but people were allowed to stay until the government needed the land. So for another, say, 20 years, uh, people just stuck around and the neighborhood stayed until about.